at this period, about 1760, 1770, there is a new passion in Europe for botany and natural history. It begins with Linnaeus in Sweden, um, naming plants. In, 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 uh, up to this point, plants have been named rather um, randomly by individual botanists. There was no um, uh, set system of naming. Linnaeus came up with a system, what's called the sexual system of classification, based on the number of stamen uh, that a plant has. And he would give a plant two names, a genus name and a specific name. Uh, like, just, like with a, a human, just like with a human being, having a, a first name and a, and a family name. Uh, and this caught on. And a rapid fashion for botany spread from Sweden to Britain and Paris. And there was this sudden, um, particularly in Britain and, and in France, this sudden passion for publishing extremely expensive books of lithographs of natural history, of mammals, of botany, of plants. And the style chosen was often against a white background uh, with, um, with a, sometimes a cross-section of the plant. And we know from his will that Claude Martin imported in the 1770s uh, a book from France, a three-volume book of, of the birds of France, illustrated in this fashion. And the assumption is that he must have had this shown to Dipchand and the Lucknow Atelier. Because very quickly, um, from, uh, from Claude Martin's riverside house in the centre of Lucknow, uh, which is on the left in this picture, um, uh, he begins to commission entirely new sorts of paintings. This is the world we're talking about. Claude Martin is, is sitting there um, uh, with his friends. This is Paulier, who's been employing mogul artists uh, for the last 20 years. This is Wumwell, the guy we last saw wearing the Mughal Jama to his right. And they're looking at pictures. Zoffany is, is painting a self-portrait at the back. Um, there are uh, uh, more Zoffany pictures hung in, in the rear. Uh, and this world where scientific journals, imported natural history books, Indian artists are all mixing in this strange artistic intellectual milieu is, begins to produce this sort of thing. And this is an early Claude Martin image of a, of a falcon. And you can see the same profile, detailed painting of the bird's plumage that you might find in a Mansour picture from the age of Jahangir. 120 years earlier. But in this case, the bird is shown against a white background uh, in this white, this white sort of pseudo-scientific style. Here is a, a more hybrid uh, example where you have one of these miniature Lucknavi landscapes stretching out in the distance with these sort of lily-put trees underneath it. This is an adjutant stalk. And this seems to have been commissioned, the set of bird pictures seems to have been commissioned around 1770 by Claude Martin. He also commissioned snakes, and later, about 10 years later, commissioned a series of uh, around 1,000 natural history pictures, which have just turned up last year in Kew. They got lost, uh, and no one knew where they were, and a researcher called Henry Nolte, who was working uh, for this exhibition, found 1,000 unaccessioned, unpublished Claude Martin masterpieces of this quality sitting in Kew. Incidentally, in the Kew Herbarium, they classify um, their natural history pictures by genus. So in order to find the Indian pictures, you have to go through all the water lily pictures, then through all the palms, then through all the ferns, and so on. And Henry has found a 1,000 uh, Lucknow, 1770 to 1790, natural history pictures commissioned in this hybrid world, preceding any other company paintings. None of them have ever been published before, and they go on show on Tuesday for the first time in London. So at the same time as all this is going in, in Lucknow, a little bit later, maybe two or three or maybe five years later, Claude Martin's friends and contemporaries and rivals in Calcutta catch on to this fad. And this is the earliest example we have. I've written here 1780, but I think we're now in the published version. Uh, we've gone for about 1775 for this picture. And it was commissioned by a man called James Kerr, who was the first uh, supervisor of the Sibpur Botanic Gardens in Calcutta. He was a friend of, um, uh, he was a friend of Claude Martin, uh, and this um, may be the first of the Calcutta natural history paintings. 
Uh, a whole set of these survive in Calcutta still, but they are very difficult to get access to, and the, uh, and the botanic gardens don't make them available to scholars. But the ones which got sent back to Edinburgh, because Kerr was a Scotsman and made uh, copies of his favourite pictures and had them sent back to Edinburgh, these ones will be on show in the And by the late 1780s, um, you're getting about 10 or 15 major Mughal artists who've been trained to paint Durbar scenes, trained to paint uh, Nawabs and Mughals and so on, turning their, uh, their skills to this new market of, of botanists and botany. And the examples are extraordinary. Um, this picture with these sort of strange uh, cross sections and root systems, um, you have the impression that the artist himself is looking at something that's very strange to him. Uh, and it, it's rather like a sort of alien species. Um, this is Vishnu Prasad. Uh, always behind all these ventures, you always got to remember that the company is a commercial organization. So many of the plants and the ones that are given most prominence are commercial plants. So coffee, opium, um, and, uh, and plants that the company thought it might be able to make uh, into an export trade. Uh, but the beauty of these things are actually here is, you know, a, a picture of a poppy. And, the, uh, and you can see it's a poppy in decay. The, um, you've got one seed head heavy now with opium. Uh, then you've got on the right of this picture, three little cross sections. Other uh, artists like Muna Lau uh, paints with a single squirrel hair brush. So you have this incredible detail uh, in, the, uh, in the root systems uh, and every single piece of the moss is recorded. This is Munalal again. Um, we think Munalal was probably a Mashidabad artist who migrated with um, Mir Qasim to Patna and then was summoned by the botanists from Patna down to Calcutta. And uh, I mean, this, the detail of this pitcher plant, uh, it reminds me of some of those Robert Maplethorpe images of orchids. Um, this is ginger. In the south, the botanists didn't have mogul court artists to fall back on. Uh, so what do you do if you haven't got this, this um, group of artists who are trained to paint in this incredibly detailed fashion? The answer is you go to other artists. Who is there in the south? There are chintz painters. So Rangir, who is working for the botanists based in Andhra Pradesh, uh, up from Machli Patnam and, and north, of, uh, uh, north of Madras and inland from Hyderabad, uh, seems to have employed a family of chintz painters and kalamkari painters. And as you can see in this picture, there's none of the volume and none of the perspective that you get with the Mughal artist. It's a completely flat picture. But Rangir has taken these tendrils on a dance. He's used to filling the spaces. So if, while the, the main focus of the tension is the, is the leaf systems, the tendrils he does what he would have done with a Kalamkari painting, which is to fill the, the blank space with, uh, with scrollage. Uh, Vishnu Prasad is another of the most prolific artists. He seems to have started on the Andhra coast and, have, and then later been employed by Nathaniel Wallach in uh, uh, another Scots uh, supervisor of the Simple Botanic Gardens uh, in, um, uh, in Calcutta. And, and again, they're, they're paintings of incredible delicacy and beauty. This is uh, from a set, an album commissioned by a man called Nathaniel Rind, who was a, uh, a, a, an army major, um, and he had a great interest in botany. Uh, and these paintings were bought by V.S. Naipaul um, uh, uh, and are now uh, in the exhibition. Um, this is more from the Rind album. But the real breakthrough came with the arrival uh, in 1777 of this woman, Lady Mary Impey. And Mary Impey was a 22-year-old who had grown up in Oxfordshire. Her husband was Sir Elijah Impey, who was the uh, Supreme, Supreme Court judge. And he immediately got caught up in the politics of Warren Hastings' uh, period and uh, was absent from the house most of the time, fighting with Philip Francis and intriguing with Hastings. Leaving his wife alone, uh, and having to fall back on her own resources. And she, as a child, had been fascinated by botany in Oxfordshire and kept a nature journal. But when she came to Calcutta, she was able to employ the very greatest mogul artists. And she called from Patna three great mogul artists, Sheikh Zainuddin, Ramdas, 
and Bawani Das. These are her children running around upstairs. And, he, and the images painted for Impi in the Impi albums are now regarded as some of the great masterpieces uh, of this genre. And individual examples in the sale rooms these days sell for about a third of a million pounds, um, about half a million dollars. Uh, and um, yet amazingly, museums have been very slow to react to this. And we've, um, we've never seen a museum show of the Impi pictures until now. The first season of work that these artists did for Mary M.P. was to paint her private menagerie, her private zoo that, that was in the, the grounds. And it, they're large mammals. They're cheetahs, sambas, pangolins. This is looking incredibly sort of Disney-like, this uh, creature. Um, a Malabar giant squirrel. Again, you see fragments of that old Lucknow world of the miniature Lilliputian landscape in the background. And yet you've got the uh, very European innovation of a, of a cross-section of the nut that the squirrel is eating uh, on the right. There are incredible images of storks. The storks, this, these are about six feet tall. They're life-size. Uh, huge and gorgeous images. Um, rather Japanese in, in feeling, I think. Uh, but very much channeling the work of Mansour 200 years earlier. But rather than the paradise landscapes which surrounds the zebras and the turkeys of Mansour, here you have a, a, a simple white background. Uh, this used to belong to Jackie Kennedy, uh, and uh, it's a, a stork eating a snail. Pelican. And then you have whole sort of natural history stories, rather like a sort of 18th century equivalent of a David Attenborough uh, natural history program. And you've got... Uh, um, Silk cocoons hanging from a branch on the right. You have then the, uh, the, the caterpillar hatching, turning into a moth, and then presumably being eaten by the, by the bird. There's a whole sort of uh, circuit of, uh, of narrative going on in some of these pictures. This picture always makes me wonder whether they were painting from life or like Aubadon later in the United States were painting from dead creatures. Is this... Uh, Indian roller preening its, uh, its wing in this manner, or is it actually a sort of, uh, is that the, 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 the shape it ended up in in rigor mortis? So much about this painting, um, in a sense, sums up uh, this story. Uh, you've got this perfect image of a black hooded oriole, and at first sight it could be a European natural history painting. But no European artist would risk that color uh, of the bird, that richness of that yellow, uh, or to make the bark of the tree, not the bark of the tree, the, the, the center of the tree um, uh, chime with that color. And then there are moments of great flatness. There's, you can barely see it, but there is a, uh, there is a sort of um, a grasshopper here, which is completely flat, as, as if they, he's forgotten how to do perspective suddenly. This thing looks as if it should be attached to Sigourney Weaver's face, it's, uh, but it's not a, an outtake from Alien. This is a horseshoe crab painted by uh, Sheikh Zainuddin. The snakes, as the, as the seasons rang on, they ran out of pictures to paint in the, in the menagerie, and they began to paint insects and, and fish of Bengal. And Bawani Das got given the, uh, the insects uh, and the reptiles. This is the male fruit bat, a very male, as you can see. Uh, and uh, he's, he, he's got his arm outstretched as if he's some sort of Venetian commendatore about to usher a lady into an opera house or something. You never almost forget that he's a creature in a colonial mena menagerie. Um, this is his girlfriend. <laughs> and this is his mother-in-law. <laughs> um, we have lizards, catfish, pufferfish, mango fish. And this is a very strange um, river, flat river fish. With, I love the kind of slightly weird expression on the face up here. Just one, two eyes and a mouth. Um, then you began to get specialists who clearly um, trained up specifically to paint uh, colonial menageries and, uh, for the company. And this is an artist called Haluda who worked in this very specific style of pen and ink. Um, and he was employed by an, a, a, a colonial official called Francis Buchanan, working in the Barrackpore uh, menagerie uh, of, of Lord Wellesley. Uh, 
we don't know his work, any work of his beyond this natural history painting, but he had this very detailed style. Sometimes he uses a little bit of watercolor wash. But I love this one. It looks as like if the, the poor bear has been given an electric shock. All his, his, his hairs are sort of standing on end, uh, with, alive with static. 